what I'd like to do is give you a sense of my journey and hopefully share with you some thoughts about the future of work with vulnerable children in this country and what we need to think about. The way I arrived at this uh, is that as a nine-year-old, for some odd reason, uh, I said to my parents that I wanted to open an orphanage uh, in Iran. And I was very clear uh, from that age that I wanted to work with children. And then I ended up at boarding school in England, um, uh, and the Iranian revolution happened. So my father, who'd made his money legitimately, ended up staying behind in the country. And he was uh, imprisoned because we come from one of those very well-known families. And just the name, you know, they cleared out uh, everyone. So he was in prison. I was left at school here with no money, had to get political asylum aged 14. And I started working in nurseries in London during the holidays from age 15. But because I was quite big, no one realized I was that young. And in that way, I kind of uh, earned my money. The bank manager in the meantime had emptied my father's bank account and paid our school fees, so we didn't have to pay any school fees. So my experience of children uh, started, in fact, very early. And the early experiences evolved around families of very wealthy people in London. Because what would happen is they didn't want their children to turn up in clinics uh, and be known to be needing help. So uh, GPs used to discreetly book me into these homes to try and see what was going on with the children and what the difficulties were. And what was very interesting for me at that time is that the difficulties that the children of the rich were experiencing at the time wasn't dissimilar to the difficulties of the children of the poor, but there were more resilience factors in the lives of the rich children. For example, it could be a nanny who was employed to take care of them, who would give them the nurturing uh, that they needed. But I saw child abuse, uh, children being hit with belts, children being sexually abused in the rich households, uh, and I've seen it in very deprived communities. So that was kind of my early experience. And, and then I'd always wanted to use the arts therapeutically. So for university, I went to Warwick University to study theatre studies and dramatic arts with a focus on puppetry. So I was always very interested in the use of puppetry uh, in psychological therapeutic work. Uh, and whilst I was at university, I continued working all the time because I didn't have any money. So uh, I would get booked during the holidays into various places. Uh, so in my early career, before 25, I'd ended up working in a women's refuge, providing therapeutic provisions. I'd set up the counseling service for the American University in London. Uh, and then uh, I was working for social services in Westminster with children who were being sexually abused and then working in these wealthy households. So I saw quite a range of uh, situations that children were surviving in from very early on. And then by my mid-twenties, I ended up in South London, employed, funded by BBC Children Need part-time to work as a therapist uh, in a social work agency. And I was very aspirational, uh, arrived there, thought the room stank, the place stank, uh, it needed revamping, started painting, decorating it, jollying it up, and they, of course, they had no money, so I used to stand in the queue in Harrods in the toy department, and anyone who bought a toy for anyone, uh, I would force them to buy one for my therapy room as well. So I gathered the best toys for this therapy room, ready to go. And that's where I encountered 
the central flaw, the first central flaw in the delivery of services to vulnerable children, which is this assumption that behind every child is a responsible carer who's going to take that child to appointments. And in fact, the challenge that most of the children I was taking care of were facing is that there wasn't this competent adult to bring this child to the therapy sessions. And when I decided to go and look for those children in their homes by driving there and picking them up and dropping them off, I'd have the problem of they're not there. Uh, when I go to drop them off, the parent is not there. And I realized that actually the, the way we deliver uh, interventions to vulnerable children is entirely based on the requirements of the adult professional and the service isn't developed from the perspective of the vulnerable child. At about the same time, there was a referral of a seven-year-old who was trying to kill herself by putting a plastic reading folder over her neck and wrapping a towel around it. And uh, the local authority, I will never forget this conversation. And that was the other thing that was very striking for me, which is the educational psychologist spoke to me on the phone from the local authority. And he said, um, I'm really worried that this child will manage to commit suicide on our school premises. And the reason this was very striking for me is that his anxiety was clustered around potentially institutionally the organization failing uh, rather than actually what is this child doing and, and why is she trying to kill herself. And I did a home visit. She's a tiny blonde girl, didn't speak, just stared at you. And I looked around the house and thought this mother is never going to bring this child to any sessions. So I took the suitcase that I used to use in the families of the rich, which was full of art materials, toys, and puppets, and things like that. And I, with that suitcase, I went to the school library and started seeing this little girl in the school library uh, to see whether I could assist her. And she used to draw the strangest things uh, gorilla heads, children's bodies, children's bodies, weird sort of bird heads, and so on. I had this feeling of dread uh, in the sessions, but she wouldn't speak. And eventually, after about six sessions, she disclosed that she'd been sexually abused since she was five years old uh, by three men who lived in a tower block opposite and the men had had access to her every day. And in effect, for this five-year-old at the time, there was absolutely no one that she could share these experiences with. And there was no other facility. The school's preoccupation was around the fact that she couldn't read and write. And she wasn't behaviorally a, a noticeable problem to the school. So when I realized uh, you know, that she had had that level of abuse, obviously I had to make the referral to social services and the police. And at that point, I actually witnessed the system unwittingly abuse her again through the disclosure processes, long interviews, and eventually they decided that because she couldn't come up with sequence of events and times in order that she wouldn't make a competent witness in court and they dropped the case. And when the case dropped, the therapeutic support around her dropped from the external agencies. And she started self-harming and not being able to manage because one of those men was actually the postman and he was delivering the post to her house every day uh, in a quite a triumphant way. So we decided to move the family to Milton Keynes, and uh, what happened is that the men reoffended with a 12-year-old, and because she could come up with sequence of events, they received custodial sentences. But what I saw through this whole process is that, in effect, children know before adults 
that they are experiencing difficulties. But we don't have a structure to which a child can turn to on their terms. The other thing that I saw is that the system is too biased towards diagnosis and prosecution as the primary force. So it's procedurally driven often, and the therapeutic reparative element of it is not as available as it should be. The drivers of the system are usually conditions of threat. So it's whether a child is going to kill themselves or harm someone else that actually prioritizes their receiving a provision. And it was this that initially propelled me to set up my first charity place to be. I converted a broom cupboard in that school uh, into a playroom. And I remember cleaning it uh, and standing there and thinking, oh God, I can't call this therapy. So I was thinking, okay, I'll call it place to be. And I drew the logo in a coffee shop and got going. And actually, what happened is at the time I was teaching at Regents College's School of Psychotherapy, so I brought all my students down to do their work experience placement down there. And I stood in assembly of 400 plus kids. I explained to them that we were there to offer assistance to children who were experiencing difficulties. And then what happened is nothing could have prepared me for what happened. Because what happened is child after child started self-referring. And because I was the primary clinician, I was uh, supervising the students' works. And then I suddenly realized the scale of the problem with all these children uh, enduring extraordinary levels of difficulty where often people were not even aware of the challenges. So that kind of model then grew nationally. But I was very curious about a group of children who dreaded the holidays and they didn't want the holidays to come about. So I decided that uh, I would leave and set up a program uh, you know, after I wrote the replication manual for the place to be so that it could replicate, then I left and I wrote, uh, I started a program supposedly taking care of, intending to take care of these kids who we were worried about in the schools. We were going to take care of them during the holidays and then return them back to school. But what actually happened is that within the first few weeks, some hundred adolescent boys from the local gangs discovered that we were on the patch. And in effect, they came to try and destroy the place. So I'd opened the gates at three o'clock, and I remember literally being flooded with groups of boys coming in. And they used to pull out their knives, rip the furniture, set the cushions alight, roll their spliffs. And I didn't understand a word they said. I didn't understand bad meant good and bling was gold. And I didn't understand what the criminal network was, you know, and anything I'd learned in the psychotherapy schools of Hampstead, you know, all the Freud and Jung I'd read. I always used to think Freud and Jung would rewrite if they knew about Peckham, you know. <laughs> and so it's like the whole thing was an absolute profound shock. And, you know, the statistics around those kids uh, 15 years ago, which is where I started Kids Company, are exactly the same as the statistics now, i.e. whatever various governments are doing is still not reaching this cohort of kids. So it's 84% homelessness, 87% mental health difficulties, including multiple traumas, 81% criminally involved, 82% addicted to substances, 68% lacking food, more than 70% not in any form of education. Pretty shocking stuff. And I had to really get to know these kids to uh, understand what their difficulties was. And it's there that most of my learning was acquired because I ended up interviewing about 400 of these children in great detail, and I will you know, never make that material public. But in effect, for hours and hours and hours, 
children spent time recounting their early life experiences and their subsequent experiences. And what I found very shocking is that this group were neither random nor bizarre. In fact, they were immensely logical in their behaviors, in the way they functioned, and so on. And there were two things they kept saying to me which made me incredibly curious about them. The first was, Camilla, I can't effing calm down. I can't calm down. I can't go to the housing department and calm down. I can't calm down. And I, I used to go home at night and think, why do such large numbers of kids say they can't calm down? And then the other thing, as they got to know me a bit, was the way they were explaining to me how violence and when they were violent was actually quite tranquilizing, that they felt calm and soothed by violence and their violent encounters. So I was forced to look at this group of kids from a completely different perspective and uh, try and develop the clinical material and understanding around them. So I sent out a researcher to the British Library to get me 500 clinical papers from across the world on neuroscience. This is 15 years ago. Now, bear in mind that I can't read a flipping thing, but anyhow, I got them all together and, uh, you know, tried to read them all. Uh, didn't understand three quarters of it, but, you know, attempted. But then I suddenly realized that actually what's happening is research is scattered all over the world and no one's really putting the clinical material together. And no one's really looked at these street children in a very, very uh, comprehensive way. So in that way, I, I was then able to gather all the major clinicians in the country and some uh, in America to come together under the umbrella of our research program, Peace of Mind, to actually look at what is happening to the brains and the physiological status of these children and the, the implications in their cognitive and social functioning. And that research is currently happening on our premises. We've got our own little brain lab, uh, my beautiful brain room, and we sh we're sharing with the kids the clinical intellectual material as it evolves so that they can take greater responsibility for their behaviors and uh, try and regulate their own emotion and energy better. So what do I want to share with you? In the end, Kids Company became like a substitute reparenting opportunity. And the way it ended up being that is that we ended up with street level centers, which are open seven days a week, uh, most nights till 10 p.m. And then at head office, we have an emergency provision where kids can call at any time outside office hours or during the holidays to ask for help immediately. And the kids were self-referring off the street, so they self-select. No one sends them with a file. We don't know anything about them. We interview them, do an assessment, and then we develop a wraparound intervention. Because what is very evident is that this siloed way of operating, where we've divided well-being into departments called health, education, social care, housing, uh, and leisure, or whatever, is no longer functional for the most disadvantaged and disturbed children. In fact, what they need is a new kind of worker. And this kind of worker, which, you know, for reference in our organization, we call a key worker, this kind of worker actually needs multiple expertise. So they need to have an understanding of neuroscience, an understanding of physiological and cognitive development. They need to know a little bit about housing law, uh, benefits, uh, behavior management, uh, special educational needs, uh, aspirations and careers, and so on. So you need someone much more holistic, a bit like a parent who navigates uh, the pathways to different provisions 
for the disadvantaged child. And really, my dream in the future is to see this kind of worker evolve, because what currently is happening is that you get one expert looking, let's say the child is a whole cake, they look at a fraction of this case, a slice of it, and then they think that's the whole thing. And then if they think there is anything else that is interesting, they start referring the child to another agency. So in fact, the child ends up being a chopped up piece of cake, ending up in f sort of fragmented departments. Whereas that's flawed practice, if you really think about it in relation to the child, what really needs to happen is that the professional setting needs to be all in one place and absolutely integrated. Because what we now know is that trauma is a systemic assault. It presents challenges in, in the child's immunity, the child's cognitive functioning, in their social functioning, in their educational functioning, and the model by which we're operating our interventions are laborious, uh, quite dysfunctional, and really serve our adult agencies much more than they serve the children. And the other thing to be aware of, so that you have a sense of the scale of this kind of challenge in our communities, is the, the systemic challenges that are there in child protection and child mental health. Internationally, it's recognized that Britain presents with the figure of 1.5 million children as being maltreated in this country. That's the low end figure. If you look at child mental health, children under the age of 16, one in 10 children at some point in their lives will have significant emotional behavioral and mental health difficulties. So the scale of the problem is really very significant. Now look at that and look at what actually happens in child protection. If you look at the child protection figures in the last 11 years, you will notice mysteriously that the figures are practically exactly the same. So every year about 550,000 children are referred to the child protection system. A whole lot of them get eliminated. A fraction of them get recognized as children in need. Now, if you're in a wealthy area, you might get some services if you classify as a child in need. But if you're in a poor area, you're going to get barely anything. And then eventually, just under 40,000 children end up on the child protection register and receiving some kind of a plan. But what you don't realize is that actually one social worker will carry 24 of these cases and will end up on average only seeing about four of them a week. So even if you're a child and you've experienced exceptional levels of harm and risk, the likelihood of a social worker seeing you regularly is minimal. And what you also don't know is that there is a fine so there is a fine which is administered from central government if a local authority has a child on the child protection register for more than a year the local authority gets fined so what you'll notice with these figures is that last year out of some 40,000 children on the child protection register in year two only 2,300 were left on the register but if you look in great detail at all these years, you'll notice that between 24 and 26% of the children who were on the Child Protection Register ended up having to be put back on it that year because they were prematurely uh, deregistered. And when baby Peter died, the figures went up, so it was 630,000 referrals. But interestingly enough, still only about 40,000 ended up on that child protection register. So government doesn't make funding available for the real numbers of children who are at risk. It only makes funding available uh, for 86,900 children at risk. Now think about it. 
if we were following the Children's Act, any child who's being sexually abused, physically abused, who's being neglected, and who's being emotionally abused should be receiving an intervention. And we want to be saying to ourselves as a country that that figure doesn't exceed 90,000 children in the whole country. It's not true. And the reason this systemic uh, flaw is continuously being sustained is twofold. Firstly, that um, children don't vote. And because of that, politicians don't feel that they have to hold uh, themselves accountable in relation to vulnerable children's issues in this country. But the second thing is that there is an unbelievable uh, level of fear and anxiety amongst the professionals. The professionals themselves in private know that they're not managing to do the kind of job that they would like to do. They're not really able to deliver quality. But what they end up doing as a result of the anxiety of losing their jobs or not being able to pay their mortgage or not being seen as a troublemaker or wanting the next promotion, they collude with this systemic flaw. So the system doesn't get to have its truth made visible. There is an unbelievable amount of uh, hiding of figures, redefining figures, uh, you know, kind of only having Ofsted obviously inspect what's got in through the doors with government creating no structures to inspect what's actually left outside the doors or really measure the real level of need. So moving forward, what I believe needs to happen is that a royal commission needs to be set up to actually review the whole delivery uh, to vulnerable children in this country right across all these needs and to conceptualize a more appropriate model of intervention to fit the complexity of developmental and social issues that many of these children are presenting with. So if you're thinking of careers in this field, obviously you've got a number of options. Uh, you've got the option of going through the current systems. So you've got your clinical psychology options, your occupational uh, psychology options. You've got, uh, you can go on and train as psychotherapists, although there's an unbelievable amount of infighting and uh, indecision around the whole registration of what type of uh, psychotherapists uh, have valid practice, what type don't, and so on. You can go on and look at the arts therapies. Uh, some schools of psychotherapy do all the arts together. Some schools specialize in one art form, i.e. Uh, art psychotherapy or drama psychotherapy or music therapy. But uh, eventually, in a way, I think that uh, the best option is to develop this kind of generic worker. In the meantime, if you are the type of personality that thinks that you want to think outside the box and not go through these streamed pathways, you could think about setting up either your own charities or actually joining an NGO, uh, a non-government organization, because in NGOs, there tends to be more flexibility and creativity in terms of defining what you end up doing. If you do set up your own charity, my recommendation is to try and have the money in advance a bit, because it's very difficult to have um, uh, clinical work facing you and then not having enough funding at the time. It's incredibly stressful. And if there was something I learned that I would do differently uh, as a result of my experiences, it's that it's a very bad idea to be an agency that has clinical responsibility for clients, but also does advocacy and campaigning. And the reason I say that to you is because the minute you start campaigning, 
and people don't like what you're saying or they don't like the fact that you're sticking your neck out, what they do is they try and penalize you at the delivery end uh, with the client. So they either block you know, your client's referral to their service or they don't give you funding or whatever. And it's been uh, tough uh, doing this work because often I have to take social services or child mental health or housing to judicial review because they gatekeep. They don't want to take the cases, but we as a charity aren't allowed, to, for example, to house an under 16 year old by law in our provisions. And then what happens is the charity risks being as dysfunctional as the agencies that are supposed to receive these children. And in order not to fall into that dysfunctional space, I made the choice of actually taking the statutory agencies to judicial review. And when we end up in court, we've won every single case on behalf of these children. But then you pay a price because the social work department that's just been forced to take a child into their accommodation resents you and tries to find some fault and touch wood. I haven't, my staff haven't given them anything yet. But you know, the day that happens, they'll have a field day because we've ended up in this situation where unwittingly we've generated a sense of shame in the professionals because in many ways they know that these children should be taken or things should be addressed, but they've sort of compromised with themselves by saying, well, we don't have enough resources or we can't do it. And when another agency comes along and says, well, actually can be done, can be done this way, then uh, you know, the discrepancy between what's possible and what's being delivered ends up being a space of personal shame for workers who've gone often into these statutory agencies and have had their aspirational senses hammered into a kind of agreed mediocrity. And what this agreed mediocrity is, and I'm not being critical of their skill base, it's their functioning, I call it the vanilla space. It's the space where everyone agrees to be so blooming neutral so as not to offend anyone, okay? And the, the, the unconscious agreement is you don't stick your neck out because I don't want to sit in this meeting and be faced with the fact that we're not doing as good a job as we should or could by this child. So everyone agrees not to speak up and often you'll go to child protection meetings and the real conversation's happening outside the door. So when everyone's left the meeting, they go, that's a bloody awful decision, you know, whatever. <laughs> but then you say, why didn't you say that in the meeting, you know? But it's, it's a sort of unconscious institutional drive to maintain neutrality, to be vanilla, so that no professional is having to face extra challenges. And these are, I think, the dynamics of choices that you will face when you walk into institutions because there will be such a drive for you to comply and for you to hold on to your moral and ethical fabric will be very difficult. Often you'll pay a price for it, but I highly recommend it because when you stick by some kind of an emotional truth and you don't compromise on it, it's like having champagne every minute. You get an energy uh, that keeps you going through the difficult times. What takes your energy away is when you make moral compromises that kind of murder your soul, they kill off something in you. That's when not only you betray yourselves, but you end up betraying the very clients who turn to you because something of their humanity has been harmed. And when they come and turn to you, what they want is they want you to choose their humanity, to elevate their worth, to tell them that they deserve better. You can apologize for shortage of resources, but you can acknowledge that they are so worthwhile that they deserve your kindness and your authenticity. Instead, 
what often happens to clients is that they meet with spiritually dead workers. And that, I think, is the danger of the current system we're running, both for the children and for the people who work in it. And there will be enormous pressure on you. They'll say things to you like, you're new, you'll learn soon, uh, you know, uh, don't, don't get so involved. You know, you mustn't be so emotional about it. And little by little by little, they neutralize you. And that, I think, is the killer risk in the provisions that we're offering to our children. Thank you very much. I was going to ask, um, you talk about kind of um, key workers that have got kind of multiple roles. And I was wondering, how do you avoid people becoming kind of jacks of all trades and masters of none? How do you avoid that? Yeah. Uh, because we have the masters on the premises. So what we've got is this model where staff are divided into yards, but the children don't know that. Each yard is a group of staff. And in there are social workers and some therapists and the general key workers. And then, if you imagine the child in the middle, you then have all the professionals, but the really high-end professionals, right round the child. So I've got psychiatrists, very senior clinical psychologists, very senior special needs teachers, doctors, nurses, on the premises. And when this key worker feels that there is something wrong, you need to have enough learning to know that something's not right. Then the key worker is able to identify the exceptional professional who can then do a more in-depth diagnosis of the child's need. And, but, it's not un, but you do need these workers to notice things. For example, what we've noticed is that the prevalence of autism in our group is very big and along the autistic spectrum disorders. But none of these children have been diagnosed. So it's for the worker to work out, gosh, this child's communication abilities is a bit impoverished. I wonder, you know, and then get them to the professional. Can you um, speak a little more about the neurological research you're doing and the findings that you're making? Yeah. The neurological research, we've got the team uh, at the Anna Freud Clinic and UCL, so Eamon McCory, uh, you know, Pasco Ferran, all that team. We've got the team at the Institute of Psychiatry, Katia Rubia and that group. And then we've got the team at Cambridge, so the neuropsychiatry department at Cambridge got a team at Oxford who, Professor Stein and all the nutritional people. And then we've got De Bellis in the States. And what they're all doing is looking at these children from different perspectives. What the preliminary results are showing is that the children of Kids Company have three times the level of post-traumatic stress disorders compared to controls. Uh, they, and they have five times the level of disassociation disorders compared to controls. And they've got the typical stuff of not being able to interpret facial cues, uh, seeing, you know, uh, aggression in neutral faces, and so on. So there's significant dysregulation. Then we've got a team uh, doing some research on how many child protection situations, child abuse situations, the children encounter. And we're about to give the children uh, a device where they can actually enter the moment into the device so that we can capture the numbers of times they're coming across things. And we have another team who are looking at stress responses in these children and then seeing if the children can regulate it through the use of their mobile phones and that piece of research is also being done. 
Um, well, I'm interested, um, if you wouldn't mind just explaining a little bit about the different types of psychologists that you employ. Um, you've kind of touched on it in terms of um, employing clinical psychologists. I wonder whether you could give us an idea or a bit of a flavour about um, what each of those professionals does on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Uh, the clinical psychologists all get very upset with me when they first arrive because I send them to the housing department. I say to them, no, 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 you're not sitting there and doing just tests. I want you to go to Hackney Housing Department and get housing for this kid. And then they turn up at Hackney's housing department and they rip their hair out. <laughs> and then they understand what these children are going through. So one of the things that we're doing is trying to get the clinical psychologists to get as close as possible to the daily experiences of these kids and not end up being in a professional silo uh, and be able to really, on a visceral level, understand what it feels like to sit 12 hours in a housing department somewhere that's dirty, that has a lot of challenges, not knowing whether you're going to have somewhere to sleep in or somewhere you're not going to sleep in. These experiences are really important to shift the person from an intellectual understanding of them to, to a more visceral understanding. So. We use the clinical psychologist just daily in situ, doing lots of different things. And at the same time, we use their specialized expertise for testing, for therapeutic work, for assisting our key workers. So it's a sort of uh, uh, clinical psychology in the ghetto. Yeah. And then we have all the other professionals as well, social workers, uh, occupational therapists, and one of the things I've done is made everyone's salaries flat. So whether you have a PhD in molecular science or whether you're a toilet cleaner, you all get the same salary. And in that way, I've sent out a very clear message that I'm not valuing any one professional input above anything else. And the interesting thing is that people are queuing up to work with us, and uh, you know, we, we don't have to advertise. Obviously, for the really specialized people, you know, where you have to use their scale for payment, I use their professional scale so that they can be kept in their uh, professional uh, journey. But other than that, the salaries are flat. Everyone works very much as a team with a little leaders all along the way so that you know, uh, people have, are really looked after. They have one clinical supervision a week through their line managers. They have one therapy session a week to talk about the impact of the work and the stress on them. And they have access to complementary health treatments. And they have 10 weeks holiday. So we do really look after our workers. Could you tell us a little bit about how you decide who to hire and what recommendations you might have for our students if they want to work for Kids Company or a similar organization? Yeah. Personally, at Kids Company, I'm not interested in job descriptions. So what I tend to do is meet the person and ask them all about their lives. And what I'm really interested in is their attachment history, uh, whether they have other talents, whether they can think out of the box, whether they're tenacious enough to go after something uh, and won't give up, whether they're going to be brave enough to speak up when it's really difficult to speak up. And those are sort of the ingredients that I'm looking for. I often turn away people who are hanging by their qualifications, you know. Sort of, I, I remember having PhD students uh, sort of sitting there and going through you know, just the details of their PhD. And I, you know, I would say something to them, how many uses can you find for a chewing gum? And then they go, <laughs> and when they couldn't answer that question or they froze, you know, uh, I need someone who is going to be able to shift quickly. So in that respect, I'm just looking for interesting people who want to come and do interesting work in a sort of community setting. Uh, if you are wanting to work in other places, obviously other places have other interview techniques and value bases. But after a while, 
once we've worked out what the talent of that individual is and how they like to function in our organization, they can get to write their job description if they want to. In fact, I've got two lovely people here uh, who are on place. Matt was with us, and we used to call him the ginger genius. <laughs> <laughs> and you're with us at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, so we've really valued people who've come in, and it hasn't been easy, it's not easy. The first three months, you think, my God, a train has just crashed into you. You know, because you just don't know where to place yourself. None of the secure uh, obedience monitoring mechanisms are in place. No one tells you you have to do it you, and do it this way. You're going to have to work out how to do it and ask for advice and be kept safe. Uh, but other than that, the onus goes back on you to problem solve, and that's very difficult for people. That's all we've got time for today. So if we could just thank Camilla once again uh, for her time today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.